I'd like to introduce Roma, who is a doula living in Somerset in the UK. She's been a doula for over a decade, and she is, a, she is also a breastfeeding counsellor with the National Childbirth Trust. And she now focuses on parenting and connections. And at the moment, she is passionate about birth and parenting, parenting as social activation, activism on climate change. So Roma, I have put, um, Roma did not want a presentation in the way of words, and I don't blame her. So she has some beautiful slides here. And she's going to do this in a far more interactive way. Um, and I will move the slides on every so often because there's some very pretty ones. You'll probably have to wait, Roma, until everybody stops saying ooh, ah, before you move on to the next bit because they're beautiful slides. So, Roma, would you like to speak? You'll need to unmute yourself. Aha! Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Hi. That's great. Okay, so off you go. Lovely. Okay, so um, the title of this is Breastfeeding Wires Society for Connection. And um, just to say, I have been a breastfeeding counsellor with the National Childbirth Trust, um, but I'm actually retired as a breastfeeding counsellor. And my focus in this is um, to talk about connection um so i'm sure many of you know a lot more about breastfeeding than i do and um hopefully um i can add the perspective of the kind of the bigger picture in terms of um why is connection so important um so humans are wired for connection it's actually one of our fundamental needs, basic needs as a human, um, as fundamental as food, sleep, shelter. Uh, we need connection more than a lot of us realise. Um, and babies are born wired for connection. So you've all seen how wide open the baby is in the first hour after birth and their priority um, above all else even above getting food is actually to seek connection with their mother um, and from that point onwards um, connection is something that we continue to seek out so a baby's limbic system, the social emotional centre of the brain, is as mature at birth as an adult's limbic system. And the job of the limbic system is to constantly be scanning for nonverbal cues that um, give us a message around our emotional safety. So we're scanning for, am I loved? Am I safe? Am I welcome? And as we get bigger, we're constantly on the alert for, do I fit in here? Do these people think I'm cool? Am I doing okay? Um, so interestingly, the limbic system is mature at birth, which means in terms of emotional content, our babies are as capable as communicating as we are. Um, and um, so the reason for this is that we are such social mammals that we are constantly seeking to um, create our, our brains are constantly syncing with one another and all of us now from sitting here together even on this call will start to be syncing brain waves we have mirror neurons in our brains that will be copying one another and we're effectively reaching out for attunement and attunement is that feeling like 
somebody else gets me. It's so crucial for us to feel like we fit in and we belong and that we're okay. Um, that we actually prioritize this above many other needs. And the reason for that is on an evolutionary level, we didn't survive well when we were out of sync with the rest of the tribe. So, um, yeah, I actually wanted to do a little demo with you, Linda, just to demonstrate the importance of connections that sometimes overlooked. Um, so I was wondering if you're willing, Linda, if you would just spend a couple of minutes, I mean, you might not even get that far, even just a minute or 30 seconds, <laughs> telling us about your day today. And I'm going to listen to you um, in a kind of slightly awkward way. Okay, that okay. sounds ominous. That does sound very <laughs> ominous. Okay, I can do so that. If you would go ahead and just tell us about your day, Linda, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. It's been a long, very day. And nine, I have been trying to keep on top of the technology whilst keeping an eye on the presentations here. Oh, Ninety-five. So off-putting. Ninety-four. <laughs> What's happening for you, Linda? Well, I'm getting um, I'm my 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 flow of words is getting disrupted by um yeah. something that's absolutely inconsequential to what I'm talking about. And how does it feel? Annoying. I am annoyed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's happening in your body? Um. I think I started moving away from the screen uh-huh because yeah. I was kind of you know I, I started I started off by getting forward and thinking oh no no what's she gonna ask me to do now and then mm -hmm. as you started doing that very loudly I mm -hmm. started um my, my bum started going back a bit mm. on the chair mm -hmm. and I started distancing myself gosh you're making me have to think now what I did mm. <laughs> yeah yeah and, uh, and initially I tried to interrupt you um yeah but then I knew I was on a losing. I, in fact, I tried really hard to concentrate on me um, mm. and ignore you, but you were too persistent, so I couldn't. And uh, mm. I stopped. In fact, mm. I stopped well between before your um, well before your thirty seconds, probably after about yeah. ten. Yes. So that's you got, how you got to ninety four. I'll tell you, you got to ninety four. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> that's right. That's quite amazing. Um, if you'd like to just give yourself a shake out or make some noise to release the tension from that. So I'll take I'll mute myself first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being willing to do that. Um, yeah, so that's a demonstration of how intolerable it feels for us to be out of connection. And as adults, we feel connected when somebody listens to us, which was the exact opposite of what I was doing with Linda. Uh, I was interrupting her. I was not listening to what she said. I was um, off in my on my own tangent and, you know, really not responding to her communication at all. Um, and that feels very stressful to us as humans, um, unbearably stressful, actually. Um, so you've got a lovely slide of my daughter <laughs> doing uh, some very lovely um, baby-led breastfeeding there. Um, so, um, yeah, I hope that's given you some insight into the kind of fundamental importance of connection on human well-being. When we feel connected, we thrive, we can think better, we can think more clearly. And the reason for that is that the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for thinking and making decisions and having good judgment, and language and um, you know, intellect, uh, as well as impulse control. It's, it's a kind of more uh, complex human faculties. Um, 
The prefrontal cortex gets taken down by the limbic system when the limbic system is picking up a sense of disconnection. So if you were picking up these cues that somebody wasn't paying good attention or that you weren't feeling welcomed or appreciated or listened to, um, what actually starts to happen is your thinking, your prefrontal cortex activity gets inhibited and it's harder and harder, um, as Lisa, uh, Linda, sorry, found to keep speaking, um, keep thinking. Well. Oh, you've got some background noise there. So, um, there was a, a study done by ETR Associates. Um, they were looking for, um, what were they looking for? Initially, they were looking for um, anything that they could correlate with adverse outcomes in adolescence. So they were looking at things like teenage pregnancy and suicide, uh, turning to crime, self-harm, drug use. And what they discovered, it was a meta-analysis looking at lots of different studies, and it was longitudinal. They discovered that um, they could identify a super protective factor against adverse outcomes in adolescence. And that super protector, super protective factor, um, they identified it as parent child connectedness. Um, so, why is that relevant to breastfeeding? Um, obviously, the nutritional components of breast milk are off the scale. Um, <laughs> I always think it's funny that conventionally we question the value of breastfeeding beyond a certain point a year or two or whatever, depending on what circles you're in. Um, but if they made a pill that contained the concentration of enzymes and stem cells and immune components um, that breast milk contains, um, it would be arguably unethical not to give it to everybody, children and adults alike. And um, so, and <laughs> yeah, that doesn't even warrant the interaction between the baby's saliva and the breast. So when a baby puts their mouth onto the nipple, um, whatever's in their saliva goes into it gets absorbed into the pores of the mother's nipple and the breast intelligently fabricates a specific tailored breast milk um, that is fed back to the baby within two hours so if the baby has come into contact with a virus the breast will create specific antivirus and um, tailor that into the breast milk, which is, you know, it's phenomenal stuff. However, even with the nutritional components and, and that interaction, I would propose that the more important impact of breastfeeding is actually in the way that it lays the foundation for connection. And I'd love there to be more research on this. This is an area that would be fascinating to explore in more depth. Um, we know that there's a link between um, a mother's level of bonding through breastfeeding, um, protecting children against behavioral problems later on. Um, and I would suspect that what's really going on is not so much about the mother bonding, but actually the way that breastfeeding wires mothers and children for connection. 
because it lays the foundation for something that we call contingent communication. So contingent communication, um, <laughs> you can see this going on in these slides actually. Contingent communication is where you pick up your newborn and their eyes immediately seek out yours. And newborns learn so much through their gaze. So whatever is reflected back to them is vital data for this work of figuring out, you know, being a human, um, how to fit in with the big people around here, how to get food, how to get them to pick me up. Um, so every time we respond to a baby's communication, it's a two way communication process. They seek out our gaze, we respond by gazing back. They maybe respond through some other communication. We might respond through smiling. Um, and that contingent communication goes back and forth and back and forth. And that is what lays the foundation for responsiveness between a mother and a child. And it's this level of responsiveness um, that is so crucial in terms of our emotional development. So there's a few reasons for this. Um, one is that um, just the closeness of breastfeeding and the kind of mechanical action of the baby sucking on the breast, um, the skin to skin, all of those things release oxytocin in the mother and the baby. And we know that the dose of oxytocin that gets released, particularly in the first hour after birth through skin to skin, is the largest dose of oxytocin a woman will ever receive in her lifetime. And it actively rewires the brain towards more mothering type behaviors. And um, her, Mina's just said, in my experience, when I fed my baby, that was like injecting my kindness to him through breastfeeding. Yes, absolutely. It's a way of offering our attention and our warmth. And that's not to say that it can't be, can't be replicated if you're not breastfeeding. And we'll touch on that in a bit. Um, so one, one aspect here is the oxytocin. Um, and what this does is give the mother a whole body nervous system reset. So she might be going through her morning and particularly in a kind of nuclear family setup in modern society, she's more than likely to be feeling stressed at some point in the day. Um, and the very action of <laughs> Linda saying, how's that for the oxytocin connection? We've got a slide here of um, lots of milk spraying all over my baby's face. <laughs> um, so sorry, I was saying about the whole body reset. So if the mother's going through the day, she's more than likely to be accumulating tension throughout the day. We're not actually supposed to be parenting in isolation. We're social animals we're supposed to be doing this in tribes um, the correct ratio for an for adults to children in terms of optimizing connection is actually four adults to one child um, and really rarely does that happen so more than likely a mother in in modern western society is likely to be feeling quite stressed through the day but she is enforced by the baby's hunger to pick up her baby and, and 
put them to the breast every couple of hours or so. And when that happens, she and the baby are subject to a whole body nervous system reset. So even if she'd been feeling quite stressed out, she's going to start feeling a lot more mellow quite quickly. She's going to start breathing a bit more deeply. Even if she'd been really stressed with her baby and she's sick of the sight of them by this point, they've been crying for hours, she's ready to hand them away. <laughs> she's going to start breathing and looking down and realising that actually her baby's quite cute. And then what's going to happen is um, she's more likely to get drawn into contingent communication. So her baby's going to look up at her with those big shiny eyes. She's going to look down and the baby will probably do something cute and she's going to smile. And this communication starts building. And one of the aspects of um, what's going on in our communication is actually governed by the vagus nerve. Um, so the vagus nerve is, um, it's switched on, it's not the right way of describing it. Um, what am I trying to say? The vagus nerve, um, it, it sort of governs what kind of mode we can be in, in relation to one another. And when a mother has gone through her morning and got quite stressed out, what's happened is that she's fallen out of social engagement mode. Her nervous system is kind of bracing itself against other humans. Uh, it's likely that her facial tone and her vocal affect have got kind of flat. Um, I meant facial affect and vocal tone, obviously. <laughs> Um, and the good news about social engagement mode is that it's contagious. So the minute one or the other of the baby or the mother smiles or makes eye contact, they're actually um, going to contagiously um, switch the other's nervous system. So this is a very different picture to what might happen if you were feeding by bottle. And this is a bit of a caricature. This isn't always, um, this is, you know, a kind of extreme version of how this could look. But for example, the mother that's getting stressed out with her screaming baby, who's bottle feeding, then has to uh, make up a bottle, which, you know, is uh, taking her away from connecting with her baby. The baby's getting more stressed out. She's rushing to get the bottle made. Um, and by the time she's feeding the baby, she might just need a minute for herself, understandably. And rather than connecting with the baby, she, she might just be, you know, taking a moment to connect with herself. And because she doesn't have this whole body reset, which is inadvertent to breastfeeding, um, she might not necessarily get brought into connection with her baby through the feeding. Now, of course, that's not to say that a mother who's feeding by bottle is not going to connect with their baby through feeding. It just means that you have to be a lot more conscious about it. You have to be a lot more intentional. Um, so there are ways to bottle feed responsively that can replicate what happens with breastfeeding behaviorally. So you can um, make sure that you're always holding your baby in your arms rather than propping the bottle. You can make sure it's always mum or dad that feeds the baby so that you, um, you, know, you aren't giving them to other people to feed, I'm missing out on that opportunity. Um, you could put the baby skin to skin. You could make sure that you're kind of looking down and stroking your baby and making eye contact. And there's also been a link with feeding via bottle and um, babies becoming overweight. And that 
doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I mean, it can be the case even with express breast milk. Um, but I think that's more down to the way that we're feeding babies with bottles because the suck reflex is activated by the teat at the back of the throat. So the baby's not so much leading the feeding. And we can mitigate that by offering the bottle and then withdrawing the teat and pausing for a few moments, offering the bottle again. Um, and so, you know, there are ways around this. It's not, you know, it's not black and white. It's not um, that you're going to miss out on bonding and connection if you're not breastfeeding. It's just really relevant that with breastfeeding, it's inadvertent. You don't have to pay attention to it. It's going to happen automatically, whether you're interested in creating connection or not. So, why is it relevant to wire society for connection? Why is that even something that we might aspire towards? What does it even mean to have a more connected society? I'm just going to, um, uh, I'm going to come back to any of the comments in the, the chat, actually. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about climate change recently in the media. And we're all quite aware that our planet is in quite a global situation at the moment. Um, the consequences of not feeling connection with our parents and caregivers is that we can end up going through life feeling this kind of gnawing sense that we're not accepted, we're not good, this kind of unease or this longing, this longing for connection. And I'd go as far to say as humanity is actually fundamentally broken. And the reason for that is that we, we don't have enough of the thing that we all crave the most and really thrive upon, which is connection. And what happens when you have a society that doesn't have a strong sense of connection is that we're led to take more than we need. This is not our natural state. Humans don't take more than they need, more than any other animal. It's a place that we've ended up in because we've overlooked this really basic human need. And a lot of our parenting practices are not centered around connection. So this sense of longing and um, disconnection feels so uncomfortable to us that we don't fully inhabit our bodies. We feel disconnected from the people around us. We feel disconnected from our communities and the planet that we live on. And we're much more likely to behave in ways that are off track. So we know what happens to teenagers if they miss out on that parent-child connectedness. And we can extrapolate that that's what's happening in wider society. So if we want to build a healthy society and we want to build the kind of global consciousness that has the capacity to face the kind of emergent challenges that we're seeing on the planet right now, you actually need to start with the very basic building blocks of looking at what way of birthing and raising our children is going to allow them to feel safe and loved 
and welcome. Because humans that have that built into them become ones that can really use their innate intelligence fully. They're not under the strain of these uncomfortable feelings of feeling disconnected that are impacting on their ability to think well. They're not driven by this deep sense of hurt and disconnection that causes us to kind of fill this hole through materialism. And we're going to start seeing a whole generation that is well equipped to think creatively and intelligently and take leadership in terms of where we need to go next. So, yeah, I feel like birth and parenting are absolutely a fast track global intervention. And I feel like this is one thing that gives me really a lot of hope in a world that's looking quite bleak currently. Because it doesn't take long. It would just require one generation of parents to be met with the correct information and supported adequately that they could foster enough connection in their offspring, with their offspring, that we become a society wired towards connection, a much more resourced society and one that isn't driven by these kind of underlying hurts. So, yeah, that's, that's mostly what I wanted to say about that. And I'm just going to look through these comments to see if there's anything I can respond to. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, indeed. If anybody feels like um, uh, going, uh, activating their mic and speaking, please do. But uh, that's... Uh, we all know that yeah, now that we've heard what you said, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, really? But we haven't really thought about it before. <laughs> you, you do get some wonderful responses from children and babies when you pay proper attention to them. And as you say, look at them and get down to their level and stroke them and um, do all this without um, being disrupted for, by all the rest of the world at the time. Yeah. So anyway, over to you. You have a look at the comments in the chat to see which ones you want to comment on. Thank you. I love this um, comment from Effat, who says, um, "When the baby tries to, so the the baby tries to cover the mother's mouth if she speaks, just to ask the mother to concentrate on the baby." <laughs> You can probably, particularly as your babies get older, you can probably relate to those times where you haven't been paying them full attention and they do everything they can to get your attention back. And um, if you're familiar with the still face experiment where a mother gave her warm attention to a baby and the baby was delighted and then she was asked, <laughs> there's a delighted baby, um, and then she was asked to keep her face completely still. So this was what we were talking about um, in terms of social engagement mode. When your face is completely flat, it actually signals threat to, um, well, to another human, but it's something that our babies can absolutely pick up on. Um, so the baby got, um, tried to do lots of charming things to get her attention back at first. And then I think even within about 30 seconds, or it could have been sooner, um, it was flat out screaming, uh, really distressed, trying to get the mother's attention back. So, yeah, babies know what they need and can be relied upon to seek connection out. Uh, 
and brain to increase endorphins, endorphin levels all over there, all over the life, all through life, relaxed life and normal personality. Absolutely. Yes, thankfully, kangaroo care is now being brought in for the NICU, which is obviously wonderful progress. So, yeah, love to hear from anyone if you'd like to. Does anybody have any further questions or comments? It's not a thing you can question, really. It's more about, there we go. Yes. Nikki, are you there, Roma? Seems to have gone kind of quiet. Wonderful to talk. Thank you. I was just holding my grandchild age 18 months and he sticks his hand into the top of my T-shirt. So naturally, I was reminded of breastfeeding my own kids. And I do agree that the connection just happens, can be made in other ways, but it has. To be. One of my children used to um, used to twiddle oh. with one one breast while she was feeding from the other breast and she would do that with any woman that she went near including my mother who was a little bit strange about it in the first instance because it wasn't quite so i don't proper. know about everyone else but i just got a little somebody speaking just then all right i was speaking but i think i was losing you can is you that, hear me is that you linda yes it was me but obviously i was breaking I just up had a, a sh short burst of what you were saying oh Yes, I think it might be um, you, actually. It depends. Can anyone tell me who it is who's breaking up from your end? Oh, that's weird. I can't hear anything at the moment. So. Can we still hear Roma? Ah, I think she's gone, actually. No, no, no. Are you back, Roma? Yes. I think Roma must have. Oh, yes, yeah, she's definitely speaking a little bit. Roma, I think it's you that's breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? Anyway, Roma, if you can hear me, um, perhaps you might like to just um, log out and log back in again. Only log out, don't, you end, don't end the meeting. So log out. And then come back in again and see if that improves the sound. Anyway, me and Nikki is a wonderful being, thing being a grandparent, isn't it? And I think that um, grandparents can have a lot to do with this connectiveness as well. In fact, we tend to have more time. Don't know what anybody else thinks. Yes, Nikki, I agree with you too. It's the highlight of my week when I look after my grandson one day a week. And he puts his um, hand over my mouth sometimes to shut me up. Although normally it would need to be other people that tell me to shut up because I spend more time paying attention to him than I do to anybody else. We're still having trouble with somebody trying to speak. Is that you, Roma, again? <laughs> Roma, are you there? Yes, I definitely think we're having an issue with Roma just now. That's a shame right at the end of that presentation. Um, perhaps if you have anything else to say, Roma, you could perhaps type it into the text box. Because we're definitely having difficulties hearing what you have to say. 
I can't remember there are any more slides here. These are beautiful slides of Roma. No, 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 I'll go back again. These are beautiful slides of Romas. She, she offered me them as she said, you can use one of these if you like, because she didn't want to put together a presentation, quite right. Um, and when I saw these slides, there were about 10 of them. I said, can I use all of them? There aren't actually 10, I put in eight in the end, but they are beautiful. And the oxytocin one is amazing. Isn't that amazing? So I don't know whether Roma's gonna to manage to get back in, but maybe we just need to leave it at that. It's a shame, um, but I think Roma could well be a speaker in the future somewhere for people. So I think I'll just take over at this point and finish off the session, if that's okay.